Ok, bueno, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Eh, soy Paul Gleason, soy el embajador de Irlanda aquí en Chile y estamos encantados de darles la bienvenida a este evento. Um, será en inglés, um, así que aquellos que prefieran la traducción al español uh, pueden elegirla en la aplicación Zoom haciendo clic en el icono de interpretación. Um, for me, for, for, a, for someone who's lucky enough to be a diplomat representing Ireland in different countries around the world, every day is a proud one and it's a privilege to get to do uh, what I'm able to do. But there have been very few days that for me um, were as proud as the day in which Ireland voted overwhelmingly in favour of marriage equality. Ireland, a country that in the past was traditionally very Catholic, traditionally very conservative, not unlike Chile in those ways. Um, and this was a remarkable juncture for Ireland six years ago this coming weekend. And so as an embassy, we wanted to plan a couple of events to share with you um, our experiences and our story in Ireland from that historic journey towards marriage equality. In a few minutes, we're going to have the first of those events, and I'm going to introduce you to Moneen Griffith, who was one of the architects of that marriage equality movement in Ireland, and a great friend of the embassy, Isabella Moore, the executive director of Fundación Iguales. But before we do that, I wanted to say a little bit about what we have coming up later this weekend, because beginning tomorrow and until Sunday, we will be showing a movie called The 34th, which is the story of marriage equality in Ireland as narrated by those people who helped to bring it about. It's a brilliant, emotional, powerful story, but you don't have to take uh, my word for that because providing the technology works, we're going to show you the trailer for that movie now. It was, it was a love affair from the moment we met each other. Both of us still recall so vividly when we, uh, there was a room in Boston College. There she was. Honestly, that was in September and by November 10th, we had made a decision to live with each other for the rest of our lives. But when we looked for our recognition, the state said no. Our relationships are equal to heterosexual relationships, or they're not. And that should make you angry. Constitutional provision of the family based on marriage does not include same sex marriage. They wanted access to an institution that was excluding them. And that was really enough for me. Let's just bring people together, friends and colleagues and change makers who we know would be interested in this with the one single objective which was to achieve marriage equality. And I think that government and the elites thought that if they kept on saying to us we're going to have to go to a referendum that we would go away, but we weren't going to go away ever. It is a dangerous nonsense because he hasn't the guts to face up to what is a rights issue. This was the first time uh, anywhere that it was going to go to the public vote. Now we're not going to have mother and father, we're going to have parent one and parent two. And one of the things is it doesn't take the best interests of the child to include the right to the mother and father. Have, have we done it all? Have we done enough? I wasn't sure. Um, life and searching for change and the struggle, <clears throat> it always does, it moves between uh, great joy and happiness and suffering. Thank you, Mercedes. Um, please do take 80 minutes this weekend. It's a short movie, um, but I can promise you won't regret it. It is 
available to watch in your own time, free of charge, on the website of the Centro Arte Alameda, uh, Punto TV. Um, it's on their web platform in the section called Hall Central. Um, but you're in for a, a treat this evening too as well, um, because we have with us live from Ireland, one of the stars of that movie, and of the whole issue of marriage equality in Ireland. Uh, Manine Griffith uh, is currently the CEO of Belong to Youth Services, um, Ireland's national LGBTI plus youth organization. She's a passionate social activist with over 20 years experience in the fields of advocacy, law and social justice. And before her appointment to her current role, she was for eight years the director of marriage equality, the single issue organization working for and achieving equality for same sex couples in Ireland. So Manine, we're thrilled you've agreed to stay up late in Ireland and it is late in Ireland at the moment to be with us here this evening. And Manine is going to be in conversation with the brilliant Isabella Moore, executive director of Fundacion Iguales since December of last year. And before that, a director of education and a director of training and activism with the same organization. Isabel has worked as a faculty coordinator of international relations with the Universidad de Chile. And today she's recognized internationally as well as domestically as an expert on issues around gender equality, human rights, and of course, LGBTI plus issues. So thank you, Isabel too, for being with us on what is not by any means a quiet week here in Chile. The event is scheduled for one hour and there will hopefully be time before the end to get to some of your questions. So audience members watching on Zoom can submit those through the Q&A function, while anyone watching on our Embassy of Ireland YouTube page can leave questions in English or Spanish under the video there too. So thank you for making the time to be with us this evening. And with that, I'll hand you over to Isabel. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Ambassador. Paul, you've been a true friend for the class and for um, Fundacion Iguales, really. Um, we feel very close to Ireland, thanks to your work, your team's work, and thanks to uh, the meeting we had last week as well. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with Monin. Uh, Monin is one of the most inspiring people I've met so far. So it's my pleasure to be here. And I would um, I would really like to, first of all, welcome you and thank you for being here. It's my pleasure, it really is. Thank you for the invitation. And it's, it's quite late there, what time is it? Yeah, so it's about 10 past 10 in the, in the evening. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to speak too loudly as my seven-year-old is asleep in the room beside us. <laughs> oh, family is falling asleep. Yeah. Right. So um, it's going to be hard because we had a meeting last week um, with, you know, the embassy just to meet uh, before this event. And we had so much fun just meeting yeah. each other. Yeah. And I have to say for everyone watching this, uh, this interview, this is going to be a conversation. Uh, Manin has uh, the actual experience of making it happen. She made marriage equality happen. Marriage equality in Ireland is, um, it's a fact. And in Chile, it looks like it's not going to be a fact. And during this interview, I would like to get some hope uh, from you because one of the things that um, it's quite obvious in the movie is that hope and love uh, bring brings, they, they bring people together like nothing else does. And so, so this uh, is a story about hope and I would love uh, for you to tell us how did it all started. Sure. Mainly because we, we had this conversation. Um, we had a few tweets uh, during the week, and and it. I remember that you said that you you weren't expecting this to be as it was. Like um, you were expecting it to be a law, but it turned out not to be. Um, 
not to have the course that you expected. So mm. how this, it, this started? Okay, well, um, I suppose a bit of background really uh, if, to give you some context um, to uh, around Ireland and where we were at in uh, 2007 when Marriage Equality, the organization um, was born. Um, Ireland was uh, emerging from being uh, very dominated by the Roman Catholic um, church hierarchy. Um, so uh, attitudes towards um, gay and lesbian people, um, transgender people, um, even, you know, people who were living together and had children and weren't married, all that kind of stuff was, uh, you know, from in the 90s was changing. Um, uh, decriminalization, homosexuality was only decriminalized in 1994, or 1993, excuse me, in Ireland. And really a lot of our equality legislation that happened in the 90s and, and, and the noughties, the 2000s, only really happened because we were part of the European Union. And so we, we were kind of forced. So a lot of equality for women, um, happened because because of, of being a member of the EU. So um, we'll always be grateful. We're never leaving the EU, <laughs> if I have anything to do with it. But um, yeah, so I mean, it was, uh, so attitudes changed. They definitely did change. I think a lot of attitudes changed because um, so many Irish people had to emigrate for work. So um, uh, I'm, I'm in my late 40s. When I left college, when I left university, there, were, there was hardly any work for people straight out of university. So a lot of people in my age group and older, so maybe 40s to 60s, would have lived abroad for some time um, and would have lived in uh, all over the world. You, you'll find Irish people in every corner of the world, but um, especially, I suppose, in, in, in the US and, and the UK, um, in places and countries that at the time, I mean, we've seen a rolling back, but at the time, we're very progressive in terms of equality for women, um, for different kinds of families, for LGBT people. You know, there was a, a, um, um, a kind of a progression that we expected would be linear and just go one way. We can't, we see now that you can't take it for granted, but um, we had been so we were we went abroad we were exposed to different ways of thinking and so the kind of um the dogma and the you know the, the stuff we've been taught with that we've been brought up to believe got challenged so many of us then came home when the economy um was doing well in in the noughties and so a lot of attitudes changed around them you know people um a lot of irish people started to um uh, you know, realize that you didn't have to get married if you if you didn't want to. Um, so a lot of straight couples, you know, didn't decided not to get married. And um, yeah, just a, 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 a basically a, an opening up of, I suppose, minds and hearts to difference and not judging people, not looking down on people. At the same time, we also had um, all the um, scandals about the abuse of children and 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 women um, uh, in by the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. So that really lessened the grip as well. So for people like my parents who would be devout Catholics and still are, um, the, the 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 hierarchy, the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy, really didn't seem to have the authority to be judging people and telling people how you know this is the this is we are the moral compass and we can make decisions for you about what you how you think about people who are living together who aren't married or who are gay or anything like that so it really yeah. changed that kind of attitude change so then we come to sorry keep it on just keep going it's very yeah, interesting so that like the relationship between church and um, being exposed to, I don't know, different cultures or yeah. um, different commitment to rights, maybe, because yeah. um, 
it happens sort of the same thing here, right? Um, mm -hmm. Most of the change and the, the, the new public policy that we are managing to get um, out of the Congress are um, happening because we have international um, commitments that we have to uh, uphold. So yeah, yeah. It, it's no, there's no different there. That can be handy sometimes, right? For that, yeah. that a bit of external pressure. Um, I mean, the, 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 then what happened was basically uh, a, a group of, well, Catherine and Louise, who you see, who you see in the movie, um, uh, who are absolute heroes and had been working in the area of civil rights for a long, long time, um, but hadn't actually been out really. They were they kind of kept their lives, their private lives, private. Um, they they decided that they wanted to do something about about the ban on uh, uh, same sex couples getting married. And then they they did reach out to a lot of activists at the time, and, and a lot of people said, no, it's just it's too big a it's too big a fight to take on. We we, we you know if we do incremental steps, we just you know take little steps, baby steps, and, and we'll get there eventually. But we're not we're not getting behind this. But Catherine and Anne Louise were uh, very brave, pioneering women um, in many ways, um, and. Uh, so they decided that they were going to go ahead. So, they, so that's what they did. They got some friends together, um, and when they came home uh, from Canada, having been married, they um, proceeded to, to to sue the state. They 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 took a case against the state to try and have that that marriage recognised in Ireland. Um, now they didn't win in the in the courts, but what they did do is they gave visibility to a real life lesbian couple, Irish lesbian couple, middle class, very relatable to a lot of middle class Irish people who were watching them on the news or reading them on, in the newspaper or uh, seeing them on um, mainstream media. The Late Late Show is a very famous um, uh, Friday night chat show in Ireland. And, everybody watches it even before COVID, but now especially everybody watches because there's nothing to do, right? But, but you know, they were on talking about it. So they really put the issue in the, in the minds of, of the Irish public and in policymakers and, and, and politicians, you know, people have really never thought about, why would, I, why would gay people want to get married? You know, what? what you know, like no one wants to get married. <laughs> why would they want to get married? <laughs> So the, the, they really they really they really started the, the, the movement in, in Ireland. So so that stalled in the courts, but they had gathered a group of people together, um, uh, friends uh, who uh, were experienced in social change, social justice. Um, and I was working, I was working as a, as a solicitor, as a lawyer at the time, they asked me to join um, for, for some uh, advice uh, around the the governance of the campaign really um and uh because i'd never worked as i worked as a, a lawyer I'd, I'd, I'd worked in a voluntary capacity in uh, the charity sector in, in social justice um but but never as a, a, an employee so it was a very exciting time for me i remember we were called we called together and it was like a, a mini summit up in catherine and Anne louise's house and we were there all weekend brainstorming and writing up plans and strategies and we had um, um how many people were there there were probably a dozen of us you know so so 12 people plus this amazing man who we're still friends with uh, um still in contact with called mark Sol solomon so mark was the had been the director of mass mass equality in massachusetts in north america and um and they had had um a similar enough kind of a journey they'd had a case in, in the courts, but um, it was alongside a very robust political campaign and communications campaign. And we thought that that would work in an Irish context. We have, it's a small-ish country. Uh, we have very good access to our elected representatives. They do a lot of very local work. Um, so they are very um, uh, amenable, very, very good mm -hmm. at listening to what their, their constituents uh, want uh, because it means votes. Now, 
uh, most of, of our elected representatives before then were only really used to talking to their constituents about maybe planning permission, potholes in the roads, kind of ordinary everyday things. Um, so we were the first organization, now it's, it's, it's commonplace, but we were the first organization really in Ireland to mobilize ordinary individuals who may never have been politically active in their lives before to go in and speak to their local representative about why LGBT people should have access to marriage, why um, marriage equality was so important. Um, and so that weekend, that's where our, stru our strategy came from. It was a, a, a simple but, but straightforward one. It was about uh, supporting, the, supporting the case through the courts, a robust um, a political campaign where we spoke directly to um, pol politicians. We brought our, our um, evidence, we brought our research, we brought our um, human rights arguments, but we also brought our personal stories. That was supported by a mobilization strategy of, of empowering ordinary LGBT people and allies to go in and talk to their TDs, their, their, their elected representatives. And then um, supported by um, advocacy, a, a communications plan, so that we could constantly um, have the same message get, um, get through to the general public through the media. Um, online was really starting to emerge. It was only Twitter had only really launched that year, you know. So we were starting to learn how to use Twitter and Facebook to get the message out. Um, it, I know it sounds like historic, prehistoric times. Yeah, when you say it like that, but like it was a thousand it was years ago. I know. But no, this was yeah, it was quite recently. Yeah. So it was about that, and it was about asking people to come forward and share their stories. And let me tell you, at the time, it was there, there were very few couples who were willing to tell their story. It was very scary. Uh, you again, Ireland is small, so when you come out and tell your story in. The national paper or even in your local paper because we did a lot of local uh, media because we wanted local people talking to local people you know local people with local accents on local radio in in the local paper you know saying i'm from this town and people reading from that town oh my god there's gay people living in this town oh wow yeah i know them. yeah of course they should be able to get married they're good people you know, so this is the the, psych the psychology behind it. So that that was the, that was the campaign plan, and and really over the the following eight years, we didn't deviate much from that plan, except for the one big obvious thing, which is we never ever thought at the beginning of the of our campaign that we would have to go to a public vote. We very very strongly felt that um uh you know we have human rights instruments and conventions yeah. and laws to protect minority, to protect um, uh, communities and individuals who are part of minority communities. Uh, that's why we have those. And therefore the, uh, the, uh, the general public, the majority should never get to vote on that. But mm -hmm. that choice was taken away from us and we had to kind of change tactics then towards towards the end. Would you, would you say that the key of marriage quality of our TV marriage quality is the narrative, the the people, the faces, the uh, proximity of discourses of what you are talking about. When you say it's how easy it is for you know everyone else that is is not part of the community to relate to the subject. Would you say that that's the key? Because you started talking about this uh, couple of women, this uh, lesbian couple that just said like, okay, we, we want our marriage to be recognized, like, you know, everyone's marriage. And then you said that there were like stories in towns in smaller um, cities or, so is, is the fact of being able to relate with, the necessity of uh, marriage equality, the key of actually achieving it? I think so. I think it's very, very important. It's at, at the core because, because for, for, for the majority of people who aren't LGBT, 
they may never really get to relate to what it's like to have to come out as different to and what that's like and, and the struggle, the fear of rejection and, yeah. and sometimes the trauma that's that's involved in that. But they do understand falling in love, uh, wanting to get married, wanting to spend your life with, with the person that you love and make sure that they're looked after. So if anything bad happens that, you know, that, that they'd be looked after, maybe having some kids, maybe having some pets, you know, um, they, maybe they having spend, it all, maybe having all of that stuff, you know, um, so, so when you talk about stuff and you show that you have common values, common dreams, common hopes, all that is shared you know, then people understand because in it, certainly in Ireland, when we were talking about um, gay people before this, um, you know, be, the, the, the last big public uh, discussion or narrative around gay rights probably would have been around HIV and AIDS. So um, in, a, in a conservative Catholic country as Ireland would have been when all that was happening, that was kind of like, oh, well, gay people are just promiscuous and, you know, um, it's yeah. this lifestyle. Yeah, it helps, it helps and, the narrative of, you know, that we are the devil or something like yeah, that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not really different. good with, you know, Catholic narrative. Like, it didn't impregnate me. Like, it didn't just get into my brain somehow in a Catholic yeah. country. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that discussion probably was... Um, urgent necessary but uh at the same time the only notion of uh sexual and gender diversity that we had so so for a while i believe that locally at least lgbt lgb because there were there was no t um yet in the movement, like recognized. Um, there was like a couple of NGOs that were working mainly on uh, on AIDS and you know, everything related to it. And then there was other groups that were like talking about diversity, but not anything whatsoever related with HIV. Mm -hmm. It was like this big inner homophobic taboo. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Well, look, we, 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 we've all grown up in a society where homophobia and transphobia is so, such a, uh, it, it, it's in our, it's in our you yeah. know, the public imagination. Just because you are LGBT doesn't mean that you're immune from that. You know, it, it's and it's like it's like saying women don't say sexist things or think sexist things. Of course, we do. Yeah. We're brought up in a sexist society. So we're all we're all conditioned like that. I mean, certainly I, I didn't come out until I was 30. And a lot of that was because of that that internalized homophobia, yeah. internalized. Well, I'm, I'm like I'm not like them you know so that couldn't be me oh wow I mean, you you didn't accept like not even to yourself no. that you were okay no. I mean I, okay. I, I, I in my 20s but um certainly had you know was clueless um as a as a teenager I just thought all girls fancied girls <laughs> so I, was I, just I love lonely. I love that like this idea, like, I imagine you in your teens, like, I don't know, 14, yeah. imagining that, of course, naturally, every girl fancies girls, right? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, it's, no, it doesn't. <laughs> right. So my experience as a teen, as a lesbian teen, was that they, I was the only lesbian in the country, in the whole country. Okay. Yeah, and then we had Karen Natala, which is a human rights activist. She's actually a judge, and her kids were taken away from her because she was lesbian. She sued the state, and she won. Yay! And she's part of our board of directors right now. 
And that was a big, big case, right? Because we had a professional woman. Mm. She was a lawyer. She went to the best school in the country. Mm. She had kids. Mm. What is go Roma. what is going on? Mm. She yeah. is willing to fight for those kids. So she's a good mom. Mm. And she's a lesbian. This was way too much to take in for the whole country. But for teen Isa, it was like, oh my God. She was being sued because she was she was living with her partner that time. So I was like, there's three of us. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, well, there's plenty more I've, I've mm -hmm. come to realize with time. And <laughs> it, it has made me really, really happy. Good. And the fact that it's, it's 2021, amazingly, and being able to talk about sexuality and being able to fight for marriage equality, it's, it's very cool, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's exhausting. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's exhausting. And sometimes it feels like there's no way you will end up winning this race. Do you guys felt that? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, some. But uh, back to Catherine and Louise. You know, they were, um, you know, uh, absolute heroes of mine. I actually texted Catherine after we spoke um, last week and said that, um, you know, what was planned and that. So she sends her love and. Um, uh, so it was good to talk to her and, and, and she's very happy and she's living in New York now. Um, and yeah, so, but, but, so Catherine and Louise were, you know, seasoned, um, activists and, and Louise used to say to me, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint, you know, oh, yeah. so yeah. you just have to, and, um, you know, pace yourself and mind yourself and self-care is, you know, is a, what is it? The is it oh that wonderful quote? Um, is it Audre Lorde about um, you know, self-care is a radical act, a radical political act. And so that's what I would say to you. I was now having said that, I was the world's worst at that. So, but now I'm better at that. Um now I'm you have a kid that. now. Yeah, yeah, but I've also I also look after myself. I meditate, I walk, I have a dog, I, I look after myself. But during the marriage equality years, I worked 24 7 and uh and I got very sick actually. So no. um, in the middle of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I burnt out and I got I got an inner ear infection and it was all yeah, just burnout, burnout. But um so yeah, so my advice is to mind yourselves because it's it takes it takes time and we had some lucky breaks as well so you know although they say you make your own luck right but we 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 had our campaign plan i don't we, know you irish had, people have this real different relation with luck don't you with luck oh we with love luck, luck yeah yeah we love luck we think we're we're very superstitious so yeah we love and lucky, lucky you think you guys are lucky Oh, yeah. you work, build your luck, and then you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got this was luck. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Well, it was. I'll tell you what I mean by that. There were some lots of lucky things along the way. Um, but one of the lucky things that happened to us um, was uh, there was so in 20, 2009, uh, we had um, European and local elections. And so European and local elections are usually to do with local stuff, local politics or European politics, but they're never to do, usually they're never about um, or not supposed to be about national policy. Um, but we saw it as an opportunity to kind of like uh, school everybody, all the 
um, uh, new activists into how to lobby because we were finding it quite difficult to get people in to talk to their um, their local representatives because in in rural Ireland sometimes their their clinics or their their meeting rooms are back at the back of a pub the local pub you know and so this there's does no not surprise me at all <laughs> well everything this happens in the, exactly everything what happens in the pub in Ireland have taught me about Ireland yeah. Yeah, yeah, everything happens in the pub. So, you know, so you wouldn't really want to go down and be talking to coming out to your local representative who you may have gone to school with or they may have gone to school with your parents and you want to tell them that you're gay and you may not have told anyone in your in your local village that you were gay. Oh, wow. So it was quite difficult. But when the local elections and the, the um, uh, European elections, well, more the local elections, they come knocking at your door. So we had printed materials ready, sent out to people all over the country and they put it beside their door. So when somebody would come in and, and ask them, so I've got any questions for me, what can I do expecting it's going to be about putting in, you know, speed bumps in, in, in their town or something else, roundabouts or whatever. They would say, well, actually, yes, I want to talk to you about something. And they got, they built their confidence. They, they realized, oh, this is my voice. I have a voice. I can make change. That it's not just people sitting up in Dublin that can make the change. I have the power to do this too. And um, so, so they did a lot of work. They, they got busy all over the country and towns all over. over. And two years later, we had a, a snap general election, so a surprise general election. And a lot of the people that we had canvassed, that we had spoken to in those local elections now ran, were now ran for and won seats in our parliament. So a lot of the, um, the what we call the backbenchers, so the, 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 the po politicians who might be ministers or, or have uh, high profile were already allies. They were already convinced and already believed in marriage equality because they knew that there were people in their town who um, thought that this was a really important issue and had come and spoken to them. So even they put, they may personally believe in it, but also it makes political sense for them to believe in it. So it was win-win. So that was one of our lucky breaks. So, so in the program for government then at that time, they put in a promise then to do something about marriage equality. So, so yeah, you make your own look, but sometimes kind of little gifts are given to you. And, and it's important that you're ready to take, you know, that opportunity with both hands then, you know, and, um, so that was that was one of the, the the great opportunities. Another opportunity that came our way was that um, so this is something we spoke about a little bit the last day was about the 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 issue around children and that that was a big issue for us and in, in yeah yeah so it was like well if you allow gay people get married next thing they're going to want to do is have children and, and you course, are absolutely right yes. We will want to have children. Yeah. So we had to, first of all, we had to say, well, actually, you don't have to be married to have children. You can have children anyway. And, and lots of people yeah. do. And guess what? Gay and lesbian people have been having children all along. Um, and so what we were able to do is um, uh, track down some adult children who've grown up with uh, gay and lesbian parents mostly lesbian parents through a, there's a, a women's camp that happens every summer in Ireland and um and so there's a whole generation of of kids who've grown up going to this women's camp with their with their moms um, and so we kind of tapped into that network and, and we asked them to come together we did a focus group with them and then they, we produced a report called voices of children and out of that grew a really solid group of amazing young people who became um, very important spokespeople. Because again, many of them uh, were heterosexual. Um, one of them even at the end got married and was mm. able to say, I can get married, but my my moms can't, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, that's wicked. They, were, they, they became very, very important spokespeople because, again, it was that like for like, I can relate, I can relate. So mm -hmm. heterosexual people could relate to these heterosexual kids who'd grown up with gay or lesbian parents. And so yeah. we were, this, that was another lucky opportunity that we... Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. That is wonderful. I would actually, there. I think we have two questions at least, and I would love 
for uh, Paul to read them if possible. Yes, Just regarding that your English is a bit better, bit better than mine. I, I, I'll tell you, Isabel, your English is better than a lot of people in Ireland and in the rest of the English speaking world. Thank um, you very much. No, it, it, it's a great discussion. And we do have questions coming in on the Q&A function and on the chat function here. One of them, Manine, is about kind of winning people in the middle. You know, I, I mean, as you were saying, and as I know a lot of people feel here as well, you know, there's a big question about whether this is an appropriate question even for a referendum or whether it yeah. should be put to a referendum at all. But once that path was decided on in Ireland, that it was going to going to be a referendum, who were the, the constituency in the middle there that you felt were going to decide this one way or the other? Yeah, so, I mean, look, we did our research, we did our market research, and we were able to break it down to who, you know, uh, who was more supportive, who was less supportive. The most important thing that we decided is we were not going to try and convince the no voters that they were entrenched and there was no point in us trying to um, change their minds. So uh, tactically, strategically, the most important thing for us to do was to make sure that everybody who was on our side came out and voted. That was the most important thing to do. We knew if we got a high number of people in the polling stations on the day that we would win. And, and that's what happened. In the middle, then, we broke it down at it, you know, by gender and age and, and, and social class and all that. And it was really interesting. So women were more supported than men. And, and that tends to be the case, I think, across the board in social issues, but especially when you're talking about things like um, family rights, children's rights, that kind of thing. Women, um, our, our messaging and on our human stories resonated more um, with, with, uh, with women than men. Um, age wasn't, it wasn't as big a factor as we had thought. And I think, about, again, it goes back to some of the stuff that I was talking about. People my parents' age who would still be very conservative in a lot of ways, who believe that marriage is a very important thing for society, for family, for children. When we could speak to them about that and we said, we, are, we hear you, we understand, you think marriage is really important. So do we, and we want to make it available to more people. And we want to protect gay and lesbian people. And we want to protect their family units and we want to protect their kids. And that, that really resonated with a lot of people in my parents' age group. I think for some men, and it was, it was kind of the men in the middle, it wasn't the older men and it wasn't the younger men, but kind of middle-aged men, um, the, the, some of the stuff that they were, I suppose, hesitant about or resistant to was just change itself. It's just change. It's, it's just that this is all happening. It makes so much, so much sense. Yeah, it's just like it's change itself. It's like it's all happening too fast. I don't want there's too much change happening and it's happening yeah. too fast. I, I like things the way they are. Things suit me just the way they are. And I want things to change, just to stay the way they are. So it's that worry, I suppose, of upsetting the apple cart a little bit. So again, it was uh, we had to get lots of fathers out and grandfathers out talking about what if this was your child? What, what if, you're, if your son is gay or your daughter is lesbian? Wouldn't you want, don't you want to walk them, maybe not up the aisle, because we're not talking about in a church, but wouldn't you li like to celebrate their relationships? Wouldn't you like to be at their wedding? You know, and uh, we had some really powerful dads and grandfathers come out and do some amazing things to, to win them over. We also had sports people um, you know, we had all the champions that are influential uh, to men of that, of that age group talking to them about it and uh, saying, you know, a, a very famous a footballer in Ireland, for example, from Donegal said, you know, I, 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 he was newly married and they were having a baby and he, he said, I, I'm going to come out and vote yes because I, the Ireland I want for my kids is an yeah. Ireland that accepts gay and lesbian couples. So, yeah, there was a lot of different messaging, but the big message was to the wow. cohort who were yes, 
you must come out and vote. Every single vote counts. Every single vote is important. So it was about activating a whole group of people who, who may not have voted. So for example, in a lot of the working class areas in Ireland, where traditionally they wouldn't come out and vote because they think it ne nothing ever changes. Our life is, 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 is uh, you know, nobody ever changes. They don't care about us. So why would I bother coming out and voting? But they came out in their droves. They came out in numbers never ever seen before in some of those communities because it mattered to them because it was about people in their communities having equal rights and it was about their friends. And also something that I mentioned the other day, one of the tactics of the no was to say, children deserve a father and a mother. And they had these awful posters trying to, you know, um, uh, lecture people about what kind of family was a good family and what family was a bad family. And for a lot of people living in those communities where there's a lot of one parent families that enraged them, it hurt them. Yeah. And they felt really offended and they felt like you're not going to tell me what's a good family and what's a bad family <clears throat> you know love makes a family it doesn't make it's not who you know whether there's a mom and a dad sometimes there's a grandparent sometimes there's two dads most of the time yeah. there is a so, grandparents and a mom or yeah. a dad so they came out in the number so so i think the, the most important thing is really making sure that the people who are yes come out and vote and then trying to talk to the people in the middle, really listen to what their issues are um, and, and be able to have those conversations. And if possible, it's having those, asking people to have those conversations with the people that are closest to them. So having those conversations with your parents, with your friends, with your work colleagues, um, you know, so that people feel safe to ask the questions about what, what they're, what is it that they need to overcome to be able to to agree with it? We've we've a question here, we've a question here, Manine, as well about the difference between civil partnership and marriage equality in Ireland. And one of the things that comes through really strongly in the movie, when everybody's asked about these questions of tactics and strategy by the different LGBTI groups in Ireland on the path towards marriage equality, there were obviously differences of views as there are in any campaign, but you could really see in the movie how some, recalling some of that was quite painful for some of the people involved. They were clearly very stressful times. We talk a little bit about that, how you managed to navigate a path through that in the end. Yeah, I mean, it was the most stressful part of the campaign, honestly, um, you know, is fighting with people on your on your own side you know and, and and what we decided is when we came together a year before the referendum we decided we were going to have to put all of that to side and 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 have a united front and to be fair to everybody uh, um in in our team we did we did do that now we all came from very different political viewpoints and i don't even just mean partisan i mean viewpoints, global political um, viewpoints. And, and, and one of the big organizations, the LGBT organizations had worked very hard on getting civil partnership legislation uh, across the line. So they felt quite hurt and felt quite defensive um, uh, about us being critical of civil partnership legislation. Um, but we always said that you know, when they went for it, civil partnership, probably if it had happened 10 years before that would have been groundbreaking. But by the time civil partnership happened in Ireland, public opinion had shifted way, way ahead of that. So, uh, you know, it, it was it was time. And then what we were able to do again was um, because of my legal um, background and that I was able to call in lots of favours. I knew what we needed to achieve to show the difference. So in the US, it's obviously a very different legal system. It's codified, it's a, a civil law, uh, whereas in Ireland's common law, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit technical here, but anyway, they were able to show the differences between civil marriage and civil partnership in the, in the US. Um, there were over a thousand different rights. In Ireland, it wasn't as, imp as simple as that because we have uh, law and legislation, but we also have judge-made law. 
but I was able to get together a group of fantastic law students who trawled through loads and loads of legislation. Um, and then we brought together some legal experts and put together a, um, um, a report called Missing Pieces. And we we named over 166 differences. And some of them were small, but some of them were big. And when we started talking about them like that, uh, people really started to see why, you know, why would LGBT people be happy with civil partnership? It's it's just not the same. Yeah. You know. In, in our case, most of, uh, of the people that are getting uh, civil partnership are actually straight people, um, heterosexual people. But still, if you make like a quick comparison, you can find at least 36 differences. Mm. And that is just like the fact that we are not allowed to get a simple um, right, like a sim mm. the access to marriage. Yeah. And that is, is unfair. And we are right now in, in a place in the time where our politicians should very much pay a lot of attention to what the people are asking for. Mm -hmm. And it's in Chile, at least, is dignity, it's fairness, and equal opportunities. We cannot have equal opportunities if we have different rights. Yeah. But there's more questions, Mr. Ambassador. There, there's so many interesting parallels here. I mean, one of them, as you know, Manin, we had elections here in Chile to a constitutional convention uh, mm -hmm. this last weekend, and it's been a huge news story internationally as well as domestically. And of course, the constitutional convention in Ireland played a really important role in marriage equality. You touched on that earlier, but it would be interesting to expand on that. And we have a question in in that line for you as well, Isabel, in terms of uh, one of one of our uh, viewers asking. Uh, what has struck you about the comparisons as well between Ireland and Chile? What's wh what's similar for you in terms of Ireland's experiences compared to that of Chile? Manine, do you want to come in first on the Constitutional Convention and then we go to Isabel? Yeah, so the Constitutional Convention happened because um, there were a number of constitutional issues that needed to be looked at and, and, and they had seen what had happened in places like Iceland um, um, uh, and that, that where it's been very successful to have these conventions to see what, you know, um, uh, you know, what needed to be changed in our constitution. And, and it, it had been in the programme for government that that's what they would do, that they would put it to a constitutional convention. Now, I have to say at the time I, when I, I felt like it was a, a cop out, you know, that they were kicking, kicking, the, kicking it to touch. Um, but uh, looking back, I think it was actually a great, again, a piece of luck, great opportunity because it was over a weekend in a hotel in 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 Dublin. Uh, there were a hundred members of the of the convention, and they really got an opportunity to listen to all sides of the arguments and to ask questions and to get those answer answered. So it was like a mini, very intense. Um, uh, wonderful because you didn't we never had that kind of access or time to every voter in the country but we knew that if we had and we and we had the opportunity to, to talk about all the fears and that 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 we could win people over and so that weekend um I'm, I'll, I'll never forget it because that weekend um uh, was so emotional my god there were so many tears that 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 weekend uh, and so many amazing uh, ordinary people getting up and, and saying things and asking questions. But again, there was an awesome on one side and then the bishops and some other dusty old men on the other side. And they were so boring. Oh my God. Like there were people <laughs> falling asleep listening to them, you know? And it was like being at mass and everybody was like, you know, and it, we, again, lecturing us. And then on our side, uh, we had some of us, some of the activists, and then the, the children, back to the children, talking about their lives and growing up and that. So, it was, you know, there was no comparison. It was really interesting. It was, it was uh, no comparison. It went to a vote and, um, uh, and a landslide, you know, I think it was 80% or something like that. People said, yeah, it should, it should go to a referendum and 
here's the wording and and it, we would vote yes for it. And more than that, no, it, people in, in, it was in the 90 percentile that said that we should bring in legislation to protect um, uh, children growing up in same sex families, that they should have equality. So the, 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 what became really interesting then is that we had totally, once we addressed people's fears around children, well, then we knew we, pa we paved the, we opened the way and that ultimately is what happened. And um, uh, we, we worked with government to bring in legislation to protect not just children in LGBT families, but in uh, lots of different varieties, um, uh, different families. And so when it came to the referendum, nobody could use that as an excuse because all those children were already recognized and protected. And we could say, you can't stop us having children. Whether we can get married or not, we're going to have children. And thank goodness that the state will protect them as well. So vote for marriage, don't vote for marriage. It's not going to change change how our children are protected or respected or treated equally so it was it was a, a good time and so wonderful and at the end i just remember there were people ordinary people coming up from from the convention hugging us and kissing us and thanking us and crying and sharing stories with us it was it was very emotional it's a, it's a beautiful beautiful story i think we have only four minutes left is isabel do you want to come in on that question of some of the parallels from your perspective, oh, well, we, we basically need the constitution to recognize the diversity of families. We have a marriage equality project in one of the chambers in the Senate, um, in the Constitutional Commission, actually, and it's a matter of will, which it's becoming a bit painful, but it's just will they have to have the will to actually mm -hmm. stop looking at what and what they are looking and just finish mm -hmm. uh, discussing the project and just put it in the senate to vote and we will win it if it's there to vote and then pass it to the lower chamber and we will win it there too and we know this as a fact okay it's just a matter of of wanting equality in this case. We, we are, as Isabel said, we're almost out of time, but we've one question in, we're not gonna to get to all the questions, but there's a great one in that I really, I think it would be a, a crime to finish this up without putting to you, Manine, before we finish. And that's, what about the period since? Since marriage equality in 2015, um, how has Irish society changed? I mean, I could give a view on that, but I work for the government, so I won't be yeah. as trusted as you <laughs> as having a, a, a neutral, more objective view on that. Yeah. So it'd be a nice question to finish on. Yeah, well, look, for people like me, um, you know, uh, my age and maybe my social class and, and, and that, um, it's it's been amazing. You know, it's I feel uh, respected and protected and I feel... Um, that even if I have to put up with, with some kind of casual homophobia from idiots, I know that the majority of Irish people voted yes. And so I feel very much an equal system and I know that people have my back and, and that's really great. But well, as I said, as you said, at the outset, I work with young LGBT people and, um, and they are still really feeling the effects. We knew that, you know, having constitutional and legal equality was a really important step, but that it wouldn't overnight just, you know, homophobia and biphobia and transphobia would just disappear. I mean, they're very deeply entrenched in, in, in our culture and in our outlook. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done still in terms of that. There's still a, a huge amount of mental health issues, um, uh, substance misuse, um, dropping out of school early, um, homelessness amongst LGBT young people, uh, lots of different issues because of re family rejection, because of bullying at school, isolation, exclusion, um, uh, online, offline. And then we've seen in, in even before COVID, uh, kind of a, a, a re-emergence of that kind of really anti-LGBT um, uh, narrative and uh, from the far, far right, which has kind of normalized things and allowed people to say really homophobic things that I don't think Irish people would have said 10 years ago, 
um, even if Twitter had been around, they wouldn't have said, uh, they, they wouldn't have felt, they would have gone, that's not right. Whereas now people feel more, more they have a license to say that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, we have seen that spill over onto the streets as well with an, an increase in uh, hate incidents and hate crimes as well. So lots of work to be done on that um, in relation to changing hearts and minds and then about the services. So we have to deal with the trauma. We have to deal with the after effects or the, 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 the lives that have been damaged and, and sometimes destroyed because of homophobia and transphobia. We have to have proper services for individuals and for communities. But we also have to change the systems and the structures that are causing this harm to, 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 to people. I mean, I always say that it's not enough to just be pulling people out of the river all the time. We have to go upstream and we have to make sure to stop them jumping into the river in the first place. So, yeah, lots done, as, as a, a famous politician once said in Ireland, but more to do. It's a, it's a political slogan that's popular across the world. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but Manin, Isabel, thank you both so much. Manin, it's absolutely inspiring story, just as it's an inspiring movie. And in a similar fashion, in my two plus years here in Chile, I have to say I've been absolutely inspired by the work and Isabel and her colleagues and so many across the LGBTI movement are doing here in Chile as well. So can I just say a real thank you to you both and to those viewing, I hope you do get a chance to see the movie the 34th this weekend on the platform and the website of Centro Arte Alameda. But we'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you.